Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our study of the book of James. I'm John Walker, and along with others, I'm sitting with Bruce Watsek, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, where are we in our study of the book of James? Well, last week we concluded the first chapter of the book of James. James being probably the physical brother of Jesus, knowing him intimately growing up, uh, obviously familiar with his teaching as he alludes to it and uh, many of the teachings that he expounds in the uh, text itself. But also his audience was Jewish Christians in the dispersion, meaning those that didn't live in Palestine. James was a leader of the church in Jerusalem uh, and had great influence over uh, the Jewish believer. And so here he's addressing a specific audience, and we'll see that I think uh, tonight, that has special implications for uh, Jewish uh, Christians of the first century. But of course, the principles and teachings uh, apply to us all. Uh, he ended, we ended our session last time by him addressing who is really religious. And this is a, a Greek word that means uh, one's external worship, like an order of worship. And he said, uh, it's not about a talk, it's about living. It's about taking care of the poor, the widow and the orphan and remain unpolluted uh, from the world. And so with that as a backdrop, uh, he's going to now in chapter two, go into chapter, I would say, all about faith, the kind of faith it takes to go beyond being a superficial religious person and being instead a person of faith that lives their faith in a very tangible way. So we'll pick up chapter two, verse one. My brothers and sisters, Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Bruce, what, what kind of meeting could this be? Well, it's interesting in the modern translations, uh, they translate the word meeting or gathering oftentimes. Um, and it might lead you to think that it's the usual word for that in the New Testament, ecclesia, which is for the church or an assembly, but it isn't. Uh, he uses a distinctive word. He refers to the synagogue. So he's referring to a synagogue gathering. Now he says to your synagogue, and so some people have interpreted it and say, oh, well, since he's addressing believers, and he says your synagogue, that must mean that they're, you know, they're referring to their Christian gatherings as a synagogue. But I don't think that's the case. I think we are out of touch with the social realities of that day if we think that Jews living scattered throughout the world, uh, they would usually live in, all the Jews would live in one section of town, just like people from other nationalities and backgrounds would live in certain parts of town. The Jews lived together, and the center of their community was the synagogue. So even though the Jews that lived in dispersia uh, had come to believe in Jesus on a Sabbath day, they would attend their local synagogue. This, they were still Jews. They were still a part of that broader community. They recognized that they worshiped the one true God, although they believed that the Messiah had come, who was Jesus. And so I think they were a part of the local synagogue and that he's addressing things that might go on in the synagogue, and perhaps they were seeing some favoritism shown to rich people in the synagogue, and he's saying, you know, don't be that way. Don't you be a part of that kind of uh, prejudicial uh, behavior. 
uh, instead uh, act and judge uh, rightly. And so he says, this is what faith in our glory of Lord Jesus Christ, you have to demonstrate it or show it in the way that you treat people. Um, and, you know, this is, a, he gives a common uh, illustration. Somebody that's clearly affluent comes in with the, the gold rings and the fancy clothes. And then here comes somebody in that has soiled and tattered clothes, kind of like a, a homeless person that didn't have access uh, to a place to shower, et cetera. There'd be a big distinction perhaps between those two people. And he's saying, you know, don't show preferential treatment one above another. Now, interesting enough, in, in the average synagogue, uh, they didn't have pews or even a series of seats. They instead had a place to sit around the edge of two thirds of the synagogue. And then there was the front of the synagogue where they had the scrolls and where there was a place for one to read. And so around the edge of the synagogue was the only place usually to sit. And so obviously the synagogue, most of the people either stood or they would sit on the floor uh, when they'd be going through a, a service spending time. So uh, again, there's limited seating is the point. And obviously seating more towards the front on one of the sides would be considered a place of honor. And of course, the, this culture is a shame honor culture. And so uh, the wealthy would want to be treated with honor. And uh, on the other hand, people might think, well, people that are extremely poor and can't dress appropriately should be treated with a certain level of shame. Uh, that would be the way the culture would look at the hierarchy of values of the people. And uh, of course, this is not the Jewish way of seeing things. And so uh, James is simply agreeing with what the Old Testament scriptures taught about the true nature of God. The Deuteronomy chapter 10 uh, tells them that they need to circumcise their own hearts so that they can be like God in their relationship with other people. Verse 16. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. And so here it just illustrates how God takes care of the, he lists three groups of people that might tend to be on the outs of society at that particular cultural time. And that would be the fatherless. If your father dies, you, you become an impoverished uh, child and along with if your mother's still living. Um, if a woman becomes a widow, she's oftentimes impoverished as well. They, they were just barely making ends meet, and now they, she loses a source of income. Um, so the foreigner that would be in the land, they, you know, people usually didn't travel to other lands unless they were merchants, unless somehow they'd lost status in the land where they lived, and they were kind of forced to move on. And of course, we're not always accepted uh, in other people's lands. And yet he's saying, you know, God accepts these people and treats them right. You should treat strangers from foreign lands in a kind and loving way, just like God does. So that's his admonition. Don't be motivated by superficial strata of society. Instead, like God, love everybody equally, uh, and especially be sensitive to those society might tend to shame instead of honor and don't fall into the trap of behaving in that kind of manner. Uh, he said that kind of attitude was uh, discriminating among yourselves and becoming judge, judges with evil thoughts, judging the worth or significance of a person based on some external characteristic. Um, 
you know, immutable characteristics that uh, none of us have any choice over, uh, color of our skin, uh, uh, perhaps a part of the country we came from, we have a, uh, a language that reflects that we came from that part of the country, certain kinds of you know, gender, so these are immutable characteristics and uh, no one should be treated prejudicially based on them. And secondly, uh, just because somebody is in a position to dress well versus somebody that is not, uh, they should not be treated uh, shamefully. Instead, all people deserve to be honored because all people are made uh, in the image of God. And Jesus kind of warned, I think, against this judgmental spirit. And so, again, as we're trying to illustrate, you know, everything that James says is based on Old Testament teaching and the teachings of Jesus, especially we find he alludes to many of the examples of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount found in the Gospel of Matthew. And so Matthew chapter 7, part of the Sermon on the Mount, the first two verses speak to this. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Yeah, so be careful how you judge others, uh, because God in turn might judge you in the same manner. <clears throat> and so we should make sure that when we make uh, discerning uh, appreciations of other people, we do so with an enlightened, godly, biblical perspective, uh, seeing everyone is made in the image of God, everybody is valuable, and the external situation they're in, uh, the external clothing, all those things are immaterial uh, to who the person is and therefore the value of each individual. And of course, he illustrates it, you know, oh, sit in this, this place, a few places to sit, and they give the rich person a seat and they turn to the poor person and say, well, sit over here at my feet. I'm going to sit down. I'm not give you my seat even though you're a guest. You just sit over there at my feet because you're, you're just a bum. So I'm not going to give you any uh, special regard. And so going on further, James has more to say about the situation of the rich and the poor uh, in his society, beginning in verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? Now, Bruce, what is the uh, economic situation of Rome, the Roman Empire of the first century? Yeah, I, I did a little more uh, research into this. It came from a little different take on this than I thought about before. You know, we tend to think of rich and poor in the sense of, okay, what percentile? Are you in the top five or 10% or 1% that are the rich? And then the, the bottom 15 or so, 16%, there's some kind of number that we have that we define, decide where the poverty line is and uh, what percent of the population are below that. But <clears throat> in a first century world, from our economic perspective, probably 95% of people would appear to us to be poor. It's just the level of poorness. Some were completely destitute while others were just poor. And so I think as he uses this, he's not saying, well, this 5% here and the 95, but I think he's alluding to two distinct groups. Now think of it this way. Uh, we're used in our society to the, the potential that if a person works hard, gets a good education, you know, does well at their job, they may have come from very humble origins, but they have the capability to move up middle, upper middle class. Matter of fact, all the affluent people I have ever known that I've known personally, and these be people, mostly members of the church, 
all had come from very humble backgrounds. Some of them poverty-stricken backgrounds, but they got a good education and worked hard. They had to be in a field and they did well in that field and, and excelled at that and became better well-to-do or rich, so to speak. However, in the first century world, that was almost impossible to do. Everything was stratified. And so it was very difficult to move from one strata to the next. Um, merchants were the, perhaps the only ones that could, and they usually had to move around from place to place. And so they were never really a part of a given uh, society for long and were not highly regarded, even though they were better off financially. However, the poor in the context of the first century were probably, as, as they would have looked at it, not the way we would have, would be those people that had lost the land that their family had owned. You know, they got, got on hard times. Now they own no land. They couldn't make a living off the land. And so they were forced into day labor if they could find it, and perhaps even into begging because there wasn't enough day labor uh, to support them. Or like we said, uh, a father dies and produces a widow, and if her family, perhaps parents are dead or impoverished themselves, uh, she's destitute, reduced to begging uh, many times. And the children of those families uh, also, also pushed into extreme uh, circumstances. So there was a chance that you could fall through the, so to speak, the basic survival level down into complete desperation. And that's probably who the poor were, especially if you illustrate to somebody who had shabby clothes, et cetera, because most even poor people in uh, James's day could wash their garment, even if they only had one garment. Uh, before they went to a synagogue meeting. So I think that may have been more the emphasis. They're really destitutely poor. Uh, they needed uh, a special attention. If others didn't uh, give them money and give them work opportunities, they would perish. Uh, I mean, it was that serious. Um, uh, secondly, the rich uh, were not necessarily the ones that had inherited riches, but the rich would be considered those that had gone out and taken advantage of opportunity to buy up a bunch of property when, for example, the crops didn't come in and they displaced a bunch of people. And so this would be the, the bad rich, where the fairly well-to-do people who gave lots of people work to do, allowed them to work their own lands and and uh, or put them on his land to share coppers and, and cared for the people would probably not be a di disparage uh, in an uh, extreme way. But there are those that were greedy and were taking advantage of the widow and the fatherless and eating up their land and dispossessing people and, uh, and giving no alms to anyone and uh, perhaps even hold, withholding the wages from their own workers which you allude to later, later in the letter. So I think maybe he's talking about these extremes more so than, than the way perhaps we think of the rich uh, and the poor. Uh, but the bottom line is, is still uh, the same. And that is um, oftentimes you find some of the greatest faith among people that are relatively poor compared to others. Um, it's usually a rarity to find people that are extremely wealthy that are at the same time people of great faith. You don't have to have a lot of faith uh, when you're rich. You can depend on your wealth and riches. When you're poor, one is dependent on others, and that means dependence on God. But he says some of the poor are rich in faith, and that's what really matters. Uh, not their financial status. And of course, they're going to inherit what God, the kingdom of God, uh, what God is promising them. And so they have something to look forward to uh, where they, they are oftentimes dishonored and even the rich dishonor uh, 
Jesus perhaps himself, perhaps they were saying blasphemy or sort of thing, or maybe even God himself. Even though they may have attended the synagogue and everybody was fearful of them because they were wealthy and influential, um, at the same time, they might feel like they were free to cast aspersions on God or anyone else because they were important people. But again, he's, you know, it's not the poor that are taking advantage, uh, disadvantage of others. It's the rich that are doing that. And so he's just reminding them, why are you giving this special homage uh, to uh, rich people? And um, just one illustration of this, as I think back, uh, I had um, a brother-in-law who's a medical doctor uh, and was relatively well-to-do. Um, but I found that people gave him a lot of deference. And, and on his birthday, he would get all kinds of gifts from people he didn't even know very well. Uh, they would be trying to ingratiate themselves with the doctor, the physician that was fairly well-to-do, uh, lived in a nice house, a nice part of town. Um, on the other hand, I knew lots of other really good people there in town. And when they had their birthday, their own family may not have remembered their birthday. Uh, so sometimes people go out of their way to gratiate themselves with richer people uh, and treat them special. And so he's saying, you know, your synagogue gatherings, yeah, some people may behave that way, but not the believers and the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. You shouldn't be behaving that way, even if others might be behaving that way. And so I think that's his exhortation uh, to them. Now, I think it was a perhaps a pretty well premise, considering 95% of people were basically surviving. Uh, only 5% were owned land or were well-to-do merchants. Um, that most of the people in the early church that were reached were not necessarily, you know, the, the people with the highest levels of education, because you had to purchase your education in that day too, are the wealthiest. And Paul said that uh, basically when he talked in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 26, he kind of alluded uh, to this same economic situation. Brothers and sisters, Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise but human standard, by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Now, so he's just reminding the Corinthian congregation, they may have some among them, but most of them among them are not uh, considered wise, which is basically in their day, you would have to hire a rhetoric teacher, study under them, and learn logic and rhetoric uh, and other uh, higher skills over many years. And that would be relatively expensive. So very few had fallen into that category in Corinth. And of course, in context, he's talking about the message of the cross. What is a more despised thing in a first century context than the idea of your hero being crucified? So if God can take the cross and turn it in to our redemption, surely God can take a person uh, that's not well to do and God can make that a beneficial thing. He can work through their lives. One doesn't have to be affluent or be uh, overly educated to necessarily gain, of course, um, favor with God. And in the early church, most of them were average people, not highly educated, not affluent people. And so he's reminding them at Corinth of their position, uh, which was common for the early church as best we can tell. There are always some sure exceptions to that. And at Corinth, there appeared to be perhaps one or two people that were fairly well uh, to do. So there are always exceptions to the rule, but they wouldn't necessarily fall into the despised rich category 
because they handle their resources in a generous and charitable manner. So uh, back to the texts of James, uh, he has more to say uh, along this subject uh, as he picks up uh, a little bit later in verse uh, eight. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the by law by the law as lawbreakers. Bruce, why would James address the law, uh, the scriptures as the royal law? Well, you have to keep in mind, being a Jewish audience, their natural tendency was to think of the law as either the first five books of Moses or uh, the entire canon of scripture of the Old Testament. Uh, however, for the Christian, even though that was scripture, um, the Christian understands the Old Testament through the lens of its interpreter of the Old Testament, and that's Jesus. And so I'll, when he talks about the law, he oftentimes, uh, like earlier, he said, uh, uh, the, law, the law of liberty, uh, the law by itself apart from Christ isn't going to bring liberty. Uh, it isn't a royal law until the king himself interprets that law. And we have a, a classic example of this. I think that's why he calls it the royal law, uh, because he's going to quote from the Old Testament uh, as he does. And let's see what Jesus had to say in, back in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Matthew 22, beginning, beginning at verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus was able to go to the heart of the issue. If you want to talk about all the, the law teaching on, on worship and what they're to do and not do, it's based on putting God first and loving your neighbor. Uh, committing adultery is not loving your neighbor. Uh, and so consequently, uh, he says through the eyes of Jesus, Jesus is giving us the royal law. And of course, he's, he's picking out a verse that was not as prominent as the first verse. All Jews recognize, you know, we should love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. This was one of their fundamental uh, faith statements of belief, but not as many of them would have seen loving your neighbor and have picked it out of the book of Leviticus and has seen it of equal and parallel significance to loving God and that everything else, all the other moral laws, et cetera, are an outgrowth of what it means to love your neighbor, both positively and negatively. So Jesus was one that is, he's the king, he's our king, therefore this point that he's bringing out <coughs> is therefore the royal law, seeing the law through the eyes of Jesus. But let's go back to uh, Leviticus chapter 19 and get a feel for that context to see how it fits into some of what we're already looking at. Beginning at verse 15, do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the, to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And so we see the context in which he said, love your neighbor as yourself. First of all, he said, don't pervert justice. And he goes right in to showing partiality to either the poor or the rich. You're not to show special preference to one 
or the other. Uh, one needs your help. Uh, the other uh, is your brother and must be accepted. Don't slander, you know. Uh, don't do anything to put anybody's life in danger. Uh, you know, don't hate somebody in your heart. If you have something serious, rebuke them directly rather than hold a grudge or seek revenge. All of this is unloving uh, behavior and attitudes that contradict the kind of life that God wants to institute among his people. So Jesus pulled this scripture out, but as we see the context, clearly James was thinking of the context of these scriptures, as well as the statement of Jesus that made it the royal law. Let's continue uh, verse 10, 11, James 2. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all the all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Bruce, uh, what is what is his point? Uh, what is James's point here? Well, <clears throat> there was a, a tendency. And I, this is true about religious people today, too. But uh, the Jews of Jesus' day had selected certain laws that they thought were more important than other laws. Uh, the Sabbath day, keeping it with uh, complete uh, accuracy. Uh, the food laws, being very careful about the food laws. Um, and certain moral commands. Uh, were very important to the Jews. But on the other hand, they might have a tendency to cut some slack to somebody who showed partiality to a rich person versus treated a poor person with contempt. And I say, oh, well, that's not a big deal. And so what his point is, is wait a minute. Are we going to say about a person that commits adultery? So he picked up out of the Ten Commandments, two serious ones. Are we going to say if a person committed adultery, say, well, you know, he's keeping the Sabbath day, you know, he's following the food laws, he hadn't violated anything else. We're certainly we're not going to think he's a, not a law keeper. We're going to see him as a perfectly righteous person. He just, just, you know, had one law that he broke. And so he's saying it doesn't matter if you break the law, you're a law breaker. You don't have to break every one of them to be a lawbreaker. And especially this idea that certain ones were biggies uh, and we select what that is. And the other things are up for grabs. Well, you might want to commit these sins, but that's not a big deal. And he's just saying that's not true. So some might consider what James was pointing out, the treatment of the rich and the poor, as not one of the most important things in the law. And James said, well, it's breaking the law, and that makes you a lawbreaker. So you're in the same boat with the adulterer. You're a lawbreaker if you break any of the law of God. And of course, in the Old Testament law, had lots of law, but didn't have as much grace in it. There was grace uh, in the Old Testament law, but certainly uh, not to the extent that we are fortunate to have in Christ. Um, you read the book of Leviticus, most of the sacrifices for sin were for sins that you inadvertently did or you didn't know uh, was wrong, not for known sins. So that's a pretty, pretty high level of uh, forgiveness for a limited amount of actual sin. So. The, the point is the law was strict and the Jews sometimes played with that. And he was just saying, don't, don't do that. Recognize Jesus said, loving God, loving people. You know, there's no excuse for not doing those things. Uh, even though society may say that's an acceptable uh, behavior, that doesn't make it acceptable. And so let's look at the concluding two verses of this section. Uh, verses uh, 12 and 13, and we'll wrap up. Speak 
and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because the judge because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful mercy triumphs over judgment bruce what does james mean by with by the expression of the law that gives freedom here yeah so again as he uses the law as he's introduced it two times prior to this he gives it a modifier to suggest He's not necessarily talking about the law in terms of all the codified law of the Old Testament. He's talking about the law that is universally applicable to everyone. And we know that by the interpretation of Jesus and the guidance of the Spirit on what is essential. And so they debated whether everybody had to be circumcised. And it was decided even though Jews had to be circumcised, the Gentiles did not have to be circumcised to be believers. And so that's a discrepancy from the Old Testament law to some degree. Uh, but these were decisions made in light of the example of Jesus and the guidance of the Spirit. So this is the law that brings freedom. And I think we really get a significant uh, uh, impact of this if we go to the Gospel of John. Uh, and chapter 8, verse 31 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So again, it's holding on to the word or teaching of Jesus from the law, but teachings of Jesus, if you do them, you'll know the truth, and that truth will set you free. So real freedom is found in the truth that comes from the Word of God, and especially through the Word of Jesus, as he is our interpreter of the law and its applicability to us today. And then he concludes with a, a, a pretty powerful statement, uh, and he said, Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Um, Jesus illustrated that a lot in some of his parables, uh, but the essence of what he, he is teaching here is found in the, what we call the Beatitudes uh, back in Matthew 5. I think it's verse seven. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So it's a simple principle. You know, if you want God to treat you with mercy and grace, then you have a responsibility to extend mercy and grace to other people. And you don't have a right to sit in the seat of judgment, and because you're so uh, knowledgeable, you're so sharp, you know better than everybody else, and stand in judgment on other people, unless you want God to turn back around with you and say, well, Mr. and Mrs. High and Mighty, um, look at what you did here. Look at what you did there. Did you do the right thing? Well, good. Uh, then I'm going to bring and rain judgment down on you. If you treat others with a judgmental spirit, God will treat you in a like manner. And uh, so we just need to remember uh, how important it is to treat others, as Jesus said, the way we want to be treated. Um, it's a simple principle of life, but there are a lot of people that haven't gotten the message. And so I hope uh, that as we wrap up our lesson today, uh, that we'll recognize that authentic faith in Jesus treats everybody with love and respect, uh, even though some are poor and some are well-to-do, uh, and that uh, we also uh, do not in any way uh, take the judgmental spirit to be applied in a lot of other ways either. That's not the road righteousness. You know, we've not been, been created in Christ to be judges of other people. 
uh, we are, have been created in Christ to be examples to other people and we've been created in Christ to love other people so that they hopefully can desire to know the one who loved us, who is God, who's loved us uh, through Christ. And I pray that that's the kind of life uh, that you're living and that God is being glorified in your life as you do the will of God and love others, especially your neighbor, all those that need that love, uh, the way that Jesus would. John, would you wrap us up with a word of prayer? Righteous and eternal Father, we humbly approach your throne, acknowledging that you are great, you are awesome, you are mighty, and within your might, you have shown us mercy when we deserve judgment. And Father, we thank you that that mercy uh, manifests itself in your son Jesus and his willingness to die on Calvary's cross for our salvation, the remission of our sins, and to enjoy fellowship with a forever family here and the hereafter. We thank you for your holy word, for Bruce's ability to teach us more clearly your word and that uh, we can be ready to give an account for our hope in you. We ask all of your richest blessings in Christ, in his holy name, amen.